Welcome to Ahead of the Game, a podcast brought to you by the Digital Marketing Institute. I'm your host, Will Francis, and today I'm talking to Carl Malin and also Chris Coomer from NP Digital. We're going to talk about the future of GA4, but first we're going to talk about where we're at with Google's flagship analytics product. Welcome, guys. How you doing? Hey, how's it going, Will? Good, yeah, good. Great to have you for, a, I think... Um, uh, the check-in that is very much not overdue, but we're due a check-in, I think, on this, uh, on all this stuff. You know mm. where we're at with GA4, but also measurement and all the various technologies that are going on around that. We're seeing a lot of um, uh, developments in things like AI, which we'll get onto. Um, but first, I'd love to hear where you think we are at with the rollout, the implementation, and the global adoption of GA4. Um, Chris, do you mind me asking you first, where do you think we're at with it? I mean, I honestly think it's a, it's been a bit of a mess, really. I think Google's, Google had good intentions with so much of the product, but, um, you know, I've, I've been in contact with them quite a bit on, on some of the challenges that we've run into. And I, I don't think that they really understand kind of some of the things that are, that are problematic on the end user experience side. So it's, I think there, there's a lot of challenges, a lot of things that we need to, to work on really. And I'm hoping that Google kind of hears what we have to say and, and, and makes those changes. So, I mean, that's the high level of it. Um, and what do you think those changes should be? Um, well, Carl and I have been talking a bit about it. One of the things that I think is, is quite challenging is, uh, you know, they, they have the term thresholding, right? They always say that there's, they're using sampling to pull data in, but yeah. You know, we've we've evaluated that and we've kind of measured, uh, you know, you look at session based traffic in the reporting functionality and you see a numerical value and then you go into an explorer function, build that exact same report and the two numbers don't match. You know, it's we're being told sometimes it's dynamic data based on segmentation, it's thresholding data, but I, I don't think that that's held true kind of across the board. Sometimes I see numbers higher, sometimes I see numbers lower. I think if we were looking at thresholding or statistical sampling, we would constantly see the same, you know, we would always see it lower, always see it slightly different, but it, we see drastic changes, 1% to 3%, if not greater. And and that's confusing for end users, especially for people who are very used to using it, or even people who are using it for their measurement strategy framework. You know, there's a lot of agencies and businesses that use GA4 as their source of truth. Um, and that has proved very complicated for them uh, in in 2024 with the GA4 rollout. Yeah, and how do you think people on the ground, apart, aside from that, how do you think people on the ground, um, Cahill, are getting on with it? Your sort of small to medium-sized mm. businesses, your marketers within bigger teams, um, what are you hearing out there? Yeah, so it's interesting and it's a great question because it's three and a bit years since Google Analytics for really or four and a bit years since Google Analytics for no, three and a bit years since Google Analytics 4 was launched in, in um in twenty twenty. So we we've had it for a while, but we've most people have only been forced to use it. Um forced to use it for like six months now, you know, and what people are kind of saying is we knew it was there. But we didn't know what it was like. So it was kind of like it was in the background for a lot of people for the entirety of 2020, 2021, 2022, 2023, bit of 2024, bit of 2020. So that's your three and a half there years. And then it was the, the cutoff, you know, and they're like, oh, God, we have to use this. We have to use this now. How do we use it? Um, experienced digital marketers still say to me, I don't know what to do with this. I don't know what to do with this, you know, and look, you know, I think a lot of people in the industry have a lot of gripes with it. There's latency on the data coming in. Like my biggest gripe actually um, is that it takes a day for my data to update, you know, right. whereas the old system, you used, you just used to refresh the screen and then you'd see it. But now it's like I have to wait, you know, 24, maybe 48 hours. So some of my reports I have to give two days later than I want, or I have to go back kind of within different kind of windows, just because if you report too soon with GA4, you're probably under-reporting because it just, it just didn't catch up. Yeah, it just didn't catch up. So I think that for me is like, that's a fundamental because people want, you know, data kind of now to make decisions. 
we could see it in the real time reports but we can't yeah. see yesterday we can't see today's data until probably midday tomorrow yeah no yeah. i agree I, I i struggle with that myself a little bit actually um okay but chris what are the sort of you know what what has it unlocked in terms of better reporting from your side so I do think one of the best features I've seen is just better integration um, with other platforms. So you you have a much better capability of uh, pulling, you know, Google Search Console data in um, your your search ads, anything Google related, any product related um, data now has an API connectivity, and that's been very nice pulling it in. You're seeing additional reporting, you're seeing additional capabilities like for SEO, you're seeing better strategic initiatives based on keywords. You're able to, you know, reduce and look at that organic activity and kind of see what's doing well and what's not doing well. You've always had that capability in GSC, um, but now you're able to compare that to your web, your web data. But that kind of goes across the board with anything. I love, I love the integrations. The other thing I like is the customizations. There are a lot of custom capabilities in Universal Analytics. You were always able to go into a platform, but if you wanted to create a report, you had to go in to a different area. All of this. With GA4, you can customize your home screen. Like if yeah. you're an e-com client, you can customize your e-com metrics and say, these are the things I want to see as soon as I log in. Um, you can reduce things. So I, I love those customizations. I love the connectivity with the other platforms. I think that has unlocked a lot. And and now integrating, remember, you know, they have the data stream capability where under Universal Analytics, you had two different uh, platforms. You'd have one for any of your uh, website data, and then you have other stuff for your app data. Now that's mm -hmm. integrated. You can you can connect your app stream data and your web data into a holistic view, and that's a game changer. You know, um, in Universal Analytics, there was User Explorer. Did you ever use that? And you could go and look at any individual anonymized user represented as like a long string of digits mm -hmm. and see their sort of, you know, visits to your website, what they'd done, and whether that had led to purchase and stuff like that. Is there anything close to that in GA4, and, or do we think there will be? There is. Um, there's two. So one is a uh, in the real-time reports, you can do a snapshot of a real-time user who's been on your site, and you can see um, you can see kind of what they've done really recently. Like so, it's 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 a. I find that one more gimmicky, to be honest. But you know, within your real-time reports, um, there is that functionality. It's the user snapshot. It's called. So user snapshot right. will show you what are, you. It'll just pick a random user from your site. They can be in any anywhere around the world, anywhere that's been on your site in like the past half an hour. They'll show you the mm. different things they've done, the events. They might have watched a video. They might have downloaded something. Might have bought something. I kind of find that gimmicky. Like it's. It's interesting, but it's a bit gimmicky. Then in the explore area, so, so the customization of Google Analytics 4, you can create a, a, um, a user report that will kind of show you what different user IDs have done. Um, oh, great. So it's it, the same kind it, of thing. You can selectively yeah, pick people same. you've bought and stuff like that. Yeah. So you can create yeah, great, segments. Yeah, because I love that. I, I thought that was... Bought. Yeah. Yeah. Um, mm. And because I I wonder if that will go away, that multi-session view of one user, which used to be my, one of my favorite bits. Now, I'm not a, an analytics pro, so that just floated my boat because it felt like I was stalking my website visitors. Will that go away a bit with um, the, dep the full deprecation of cookies uh, later this year? I can't imagine it would, do you think, Carl? Um, yeah, well, it's it's interesting. They keep kicking that cookie can down the road, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we'll see. I think the whole thing with cookies and the way that these um, the way that these users are being tracked is probably, you know, a hashed version of an ID. Who knows if it's if it's going to be fully deprecated? We may lose a lot of a lot of. Um, data with this cookie deprecation but the hope is that we do get some of it back through modeling and indeed through things like ai capabilities and all of that which i know chris is dying dying to talk about so um <laughs> so yeah we will we will we'll, we'll bring chris in for this one well they've already rolled out the privacy sandbox to so many users so it's clearly happening isn't it mm. 
Um, be like there's the consent mode and all of that stuff. So correct. And Google signals like if you're logged into Google, there's always going to be some methodology that's going to allow them to track user level detail without cookies. They they have the technology to follow pathways without using cookies. But I think you will lose a portion when you lose somebody who's not willing to log in or not willing to consent. You are going to you're mm-hmm. going to lose that, and that's where the AI piece and the machine learning are supposed to kick in. And, and tell you what the user behavior appears to be based on, you know, historical reference. Do you know what, though? I think one thing that one gripe I've heard from people who I, you know, on my courses, on my marketing courses, when it's when GA4 comes up, is the setup. There's a lot of really technical terminology in the setup um, wizard, the setup assistant. And one of them is about Google signals. And I, I don't sense that your average marketer is particularly clear on what that Google audience signals thing that you're supposed to kind of say that you sorted out as one of the things on the checklist in the setup assistant are. Um, can anybody give me a brief explanation of that? Chris, yeah. what do you, what's your... Yeah, uh... I, the, so the gist of it is allowing the ability of segmentation. So it's the ability to track, you know, some type of like demographic information to be able to create audience segments. So it's mm. behavior, it's demographics, it's geographic location. Um, those Google signals, they I don't know why they call it Google signals, but I, it, mm. it basically creates an audience segmentation. So when you opt into that and you're tracking Google signals, you are allowing segmentations to be created. So if somebody wants to track by gender, as long as Google signals are on, you can do that. Now, if you turn that off, then that's where AI and machine learning are supposed to pick up and say, this behavior appears to be based on other users who are using Google signals. So that's the gist of it. Uh, the setup has been weird. The other thing that was frustrating is during the setup, people were like, well, I've set up everything that I, I was supposed to, but I'm still getting all these alerts. And I'm like, yeah. oh yeah, there's a checkbox after you've done it that you have to click on to confirm you've done it. And I was like, that's a bit redundant and silly, but it, it was a frustrating setup. I think for a lot of people, we ended up doing over a thousand GA4 setups, even wow. for clients that are not MP digital clients, because people were paying simply to be able to be like, I don't want to deal with this, please do so. So it ended up creating an additional product for MP digital, which was a lovely revenue stream. But I, we also heard all the frustration from people just like, hey, I, why is it so complicated? Universal Analytics, I, I was part of the transition. I don't remember it being as complicated as it, as it has been no. between UA and GA4. So. No, absolutely not. Um, right, and, and you just uh, out of interest, Chris, those pain points that you're hearing, you're clearly quite close to your customers. What, what are the, is there a handful of common themes there that you're hearing in those pain points? Oh, tons, yeah. I mean, the the gist of it is that it's not user friendly. Like the, right. the platform has a steep learning curve, and 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 not just for small medium businesses. For people who have used these platforms for years, Kahal and I have talked about our frustrations with it. Like, it's not a user friendly platform. Some of the definitions and terminologies are confusing. Um, some of the some of the terminology changes simply between Universal Analytics and GA four are confusing. Yeah. They were the same thing. They just rebranded it or renamed and. And we were like, well, why? So I, I think that's the biggest learning curve for people is is just user experience. It's hard to use. Hmm. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, and, and you're right, different cha- you know, metrics like bounce rate has been flipped to uh, engagement time or engagement uh, average engagement rate, hasn't it, yeah. um, et cetera. Uh, what do you think, Carl, with, the, with your clients? What are the common kind of pain points you're hearing and how are you getting over them? Yeah, so I think... It, it's it's about the intuitiveness of the platform so it's hard to find stuff it's hard to find things it's hard to know what things are called you mentioned during the setup there so when you're setting something up you need to tick a bunch of boxes if you are using a payment gateway you need to configure your google tag to exclude certain um to exclude right. certain referrals and stuff like that but it's not hmm. immediately intuitive where to do this or why you should do this you know because when you configure your google tag there's a button that says show more options and it's in with it's within show more options you know and same with thresholding if you want to change your reporting identity to get rid of that thresholding you have to press the show more options button first of all you have Mm -hmm. to find the show more options button and know where that is so 
like true trial and error and true doing things like using Facebook Business Manager, which is another difficult the platform. You have this kind of divining rod of how to get around really awkward platforms to find the stuff that you need. And then you can relay that to your... Um, do you know, you, you mentioned that the tag. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, you, you mentioned the tag there. Do mm. you still need to use Google Tag Manager for anything? Because, you know, GA4 obviously captures events now, so it can, in theory, capture anything like the play of a video, the percentage of a video played, and all these kind of things that UA couldn't track. So do we need Tag Manager for that stuff anymore? Oh, right, Chris, you're saying yes. What what, what kind of stuff? Uh, Carl and I have also talked about this. It's, um, it, it isn't necessary. We, we tell people, we say highly 50 times. We highly, 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 highly recommend using GTM. Um, no way. It's, it's just better overall in terms of organizational structure. It's better in terms of tracking. It's cleaner. Mm. Um, less impact on data layer, you know, for, for those who have more complex websites. I mean, it's it's just the easier way to go. There's a bit of a learning curve, which we will cover in our webinar in a few weeks. Kyle and I are going to go through that as well. Right. Um, we'll talk about how to set that up and, and what it looks like. And there there's a slight learning curve. But honestly, the, the long term uh, benefits from it are just super useful. And I, I know Kyle is probably wanna, going to want to add to that. Yeah, yeah, do tell me, other than the actual installing of GA4 through Google Tag Manager, are you saying there's still some custom events or something that I, I that is useful to me there? I see, like, Google Tag Manager as a piano tuner. So it's oh, like man. you're tuning up your Google Analytics. You're tuning up your GA4 okay. by using Google Tag Manager to fire events in. A lot of the events like standard events can kind of be broadly recreated in the Google Analytics 4 interface, like the old thank you page tracking and stuff like that, but it's remarkably difficult. Whereas with Google, An with, whereas with Google Tag Manager, it's a lot easier. So I see it as like, when you get Google Analytics 4 out of the box, it's out of tune and you need to tune it up. And what I use is Google Tag Manager to tune it up to make sure that it fits you know, the purpose that I use it for. So, you know, it, it's quite remarkable that they've made it more difficult to create events within the GA4 interface, and it's easier to do it in a separate interface, and that's Google Tag Manager. Yeah, I, I thought that was supposed to be half the promise of it was you would handle that stuff in GA4 because it was such an events-led, you know, it's event-led tracking, yeah. isn't it? Um, yeah, okay. Um, so what what are you going to cover in the webinar when it comes to better using GA4? Come on. <laughs> yeah, so I suppose with setup is definitely one. What reports to use and then how to tune your system. How to tune your system and configure it for you. So you can't use GA4 effectively without using Google Tag Manager. And that's just that's just the way it is. And like the thing with Google Tag Manager is when you get your head around the first few kind of customizations in Google Tag Manager, it snowballs and then you can kind of feel like you can do anything. So mm -hmm. it's that initial steep learning curve that like Chris has talked about, the kind of the hurdle of, oh, this looks complicated. But actually, when you get your first one under the belt, you know, you kind of go, yeah, I can do that again. And then it gives you the confidence to try different things and you can really have this really fantastically customized GA4 that you're working with. Of course, the challenge is the latency, but you know, um, once you get over that hurdle, I think it's, it, that's mm. the big thing for the webinar. Get over the hurdle of, it's not as scary as you think. Great. Chris, um, give us a bit of an overview. What are you going to be covering in the webinar in March? Yeah, I think that that's going to be the gist of it. I think we've, we've talked before about setting up GA4, some of the limitations, the overview. Now we're just going to get into the nitty gritty. Like, how do we use it? How do we use it for measurement framework? How do we how do we create actionable insights out of it? We, we barely touched on it in the last webinar, and some of the feedback was, if you're a new user, this is fantastic. For a more advanced user, we need more. So this next webinar is going into that we need more section. So it is going to touch on the GTM. It is going to get into the buckets. It is going to get into the the strategy and reporting, like the reports that you need to use, but also how to create them, 
how to customize some of your pages on there, what to look for. So, you know, there's lead gen clients and whatever your events are, you know, how to get them up and running. That's where the GTM piece comes in. If it's not covered, you know, automatically, in most cases, it's not. For e-com, it's, it's so much easier. You know, e-com events are tracked. Purchases are tracked. You know, yep. those are events that you don't necessarily have to track through um, in GTM. But we're going to go through all of that, get into the nitty gritty. And it's a two-based session, um, or two one-and-a-half-hour sessions. So the first one's getting it up and then giving some homework, being like, hey, try this out, test it out, and then come back to us with more questions. Let's get into the next phase of that. So it's going to be getting into the super nitty gritty that that we deal with uh, as analysts every day. And I'm, I'm really excited about it because I think people have been asking for it for a while, but we really haven't been able to do it effectively without just constantly dealing with the challenges that we've had. And now I think we've, we understand the, ch uh, the challenges. We may not be able to solve for them, but here's our workarounds. Nice, can't wait, that, that sounds great. Um, Chris, you used the term actionable insights up there. Um, tell me what that means in 2024 and tell me how you're actually, you know, what, what that means for your clients particularly today. It's such a buzzword, and I, I feel bad when we when we say it out loud. People constantly say actionable insights, actionable insights. For us at MP Digital, when we say actionable insights, it's what can a client or end user look at to be able to make a strategic decision that is going to benefit their, their company, their revenue, their lead gen. So what can I look at, trended, day over day, anything like that? And it's not just the data available, it's how to look at it. Um, and... And that is what I consider an actionable insight. What can I do to make the make a strategic change for the better, or am I on the right path? And it's the biggest thing is education. When when we talk mm -hmm. to clients, you know, we have clients that will call us and be like, "Oh, I looked at the I looked at the data today, and then I looked at it yesterday, and I don't see a positive ROAS." And I'm like, "Well, you don't really evaluate return on ad spend day over day. You usually look over week over week, month over month, quarter over quarter." That SEO and paid media, they're a long game. Uh, for small, medium businesses, that's really hard to digest because this, for small, medium businesses, these this is their livelihood, right? I'm trying to make money to pay for my family, take care of myself, take care of my business. So this waiting game is kind of terrifying for them, right? They wanna see things yesterday. They wanna see positive impact and that's yeah. just not how the digital media world works. Um, so that's what actual insights are. Just being able to to look at the data the right way, why, excuse me, right way, to make a strategic decision for the better. And are we talking about, you know, micro decisions here, like the the color of a button on a website, or, or are we talking about often much bigger things, like you know the the way our, our kind of core value proposition as a business, or is it potentially anything? Yeah, I mean it's. I would I would be reluctant to say that it has very little to do with creative, right? Um, mm. Creative either works or it doesn't. They, you usually need a digital asset management platform. People call it a dam. Um, you need a dam to really evaluate, like whether it's male or female in the creative, which performed better. Did the color yellow or purple perform better? The digital asset management platforms do a really good job of that. They're just highly, highly expensive. Most of what we do for our SMB uh, clients is we're really focused on digital media changes. So like if we are noticing that a keyword is performing really well, we try to push that to the point of diminishing returns. Where are the diminishing returns? How much money can we put in it effectively? Um, same thing with paid media. Like we, we find that SMBs are really nervous to spend a lot of money in the paid media realm, but you know paid media is expensive. So we tell people don't even bother advertising in Facebook. If you're not spending five, ten thousand, fifteen thousand dollars a month, you're just gonna get drowned out by everyone else that is spending that. But you can very effectively use, you know, search ads and you can spend a much less amount of money and still get a really positive impact and we'll evaluate the diminishing returns there. How much money can we put that you're comfortable spending to make you a positive ROAS to get that return for you? And then when we see that diminishing return, we're like, boom, let's take it back. Let's take this money, either bucket it for another, you know, another platform, another time, or, you know, let's put it into something else, another campaign, another strategy. Are we still focused on conversion, engagement, brand awareness? What does that look like? Yes. Nice. What would, about you, Carl? What does that mean for you and your clients? Yeah, I just want to pick up what Chris said there around mm. when things change. 
And that's what we're looking for, you know. It's when things change or when things are different or when things are weird. And we just, you, you kind of look at it and you go, well, this keyword's hot now. So why is that? And you investigate, you know, but we're always looking for points to change. And actionable insights tend to come out of those aha moments, those eureka moments where you're like, oh, something's after happening here. Because A is different than B, mobile is different than desktop. You know, this page is different than that page. This keyword is performing better than last month. You know, something comparing to something else in order to see a change. And once there's a change, whether it's positive or negative, you can make a decision from that. And that's literally it. When you can see something positive happening, you put the foot down the gas. And when you see something negative happening, you might kind of pull back or or, or kind of reconfigure. But it's that change that spurs the actionable insight. And that's what we're looking for, you know, all the time. So it's not some kind of, you know, like city of gold that's off the Amazon and no one can find it. It's actually just really? something in plain sight. <laughs> something has changed slightly. And that's what we're trying to, that's what we're trying to find. It's funny you say that, Cahal, because do you remember when people said big data all the time? They're like, we need big data. And I'm like, you've always had big data. Like it has always been there. You are collecting big data as we speak. You just don't know how to use it. And I think that actionable insight, that word or the phrase actionable insights does the same thing. People are like, well, what, what does it mean? How does it impact? And people think it is something fancy. And I'm like, it might literally be a 1% change in something where we're like, ooh, that's interesting. Everything else is flat. This has changed slightly. That looks good. Let's evaluate it. Yeah, that's true. That's that that's optimization, right? You know, um, and that's that's what we're all trying to do is just drive that effectiveness. Um, and in terms of the job of driving that effectiveness and optimizing marketing, what things are you seeing emerge? You know, if we start to look towards the horizon and what might you know the future of this stuff might look like, what kind of things are we seeing emerge there? Um, in that realm of optimization and um, improving our marketing effectiveness. Cahill? Yeah. Um, yeah. So as everything, it's all AI and search generative experiences and all these things. So what I think, and this is where I keep using this word human. So like the human use of a website is I'm using it to complete a task. And that's what GA4 is set up to measure. I am going to use a website as a utility. I'm going to press a button. I'm going to watch a video. I'm going to do something. But ultimately, I'm using it as a utility. So what GA4 tends to do is record how humans use websites. Now, the next generation of marketing is going to be, in to my mind, the humanization of marketing. So we're using all of our faculties and all of our senses to do things like search. So with search, it would have been an input to get a result. So a text input to get a result. You know, that was our single input was a text input. Our next inputs will be things like, I'm going to circle this picture or I'm going to point at something or I'm going to use my voice. It's all of our human attributes that we're going to use. So the inputs are changing. The inputs are changing from those simple, straightforward text kind of inputs to yeah. a point or a look or like something you vocalize so the measurement of that is going to be tricky i have to say i i think that you know we're it's we're going to see some very interesting developments in these kind of linked products which chris has talked about like google search console or google ads because they're ultimately on the front line in terms of collecting that first party interactions with google so SGE will be measured to Search Console. The new AI-powered Google Ads will be measured, obviously, to Google Ads. Those mm. integrations will then, therefore, have to feed back into GA4 and present what those inputs actually look like. So how are people searching? How are people using YouTube? How are people using the search engine? But it's no. tricky, that isn't it? Because you know, if you're optimizing in, in in this sort of very old traditional world, you you buy against some keywords, well, you can optimize for the keywords that perform better. And the more you put that in the hands of AI, then the more you have to put the optimization in its hands as well, because you don't really know what you're optimizing against anyway. You just say you you know you started off by just handing over your money and saying do your thing. Um. So are we? Is it just sort of where? Does that just lead to a giving up, just basically passing off far more of that work to AI? Do you think that will happen quickly 
over the next year or two? Yes and no. Depends on on how people are using it. So, like all these things, take time to kind of get a foothold in the in the consumer sphere. So, for example, like with ChatGPT, it sent everyone into mm. Tailspin when it was launched, but Bing still only has five percent market share. You know, yeah. so it takes a while for these things to really kind of ground themselves in the c- customer psyche. So, how are people using these? So. I do think that AI will, for a while, do a bit of the heavy lifting for those kind of early adopters. And that's what we'll use as our test case. And then we'll have a better roadmap for what's coming next. But the majority of people are yeah. probably not going to be doing all the supercharged things that the SGE and all the kind of AI powered technology can do very, in any time soon. You know, so yeah, sure. A bit of time yeah. Before we see it happen. Chris, what do you think the future of measurement and insight and optimization look like in marketing? I think we'll see scalability through AI for sure. So, I mean, at MP Digital, what we're what we're going to be exploring this year is using AI to help us evaluate optimizations and decision making. So, you know, uh, the the SMB division of MP Digital and PXL. Um, you know, we have 500 clients. So the biggest mm-hmm. challenge in terms of revenue opportunity um, for us and just making sure that we're servicing the clients the way that we would ser- service an enterprise client is essentially having either scalability or, or more people. Um, <clears throat> so I, I evaluate, I, th- I kind of see the idea of AI taking over on that scalability. I mean, I just hired an AI person on our team that will be starting in about two weeks. and. She, our goal to come in is, I was like, I'd like you to evaluate paid media opportunities, use AI to, to make actionable insights, you know, you take that optimization, take that data and mm. see if AI can do the same thing that our analysts are doing. So we're going to do a side-by-side comparison. What kind of tools gonna... are you going to, is she likely to deploy, do you think? Oh, Lord knows. I mean, I, I. That's her job. <laughs> yeah. Well, I started looking at, you know, I'm not an AI person. I love the concept of it, but like mm. my Python skills are at best like mediocre compared to my team members. Thank God they're good. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it, she, we can script in Python to create automation and, and evaluate the data that's coming through. So she gave me about 30 platforms that she's decent in. Um, I'm quite sure she's a human computer at this point. Um, but some things I'd never mm. even heard of. And she's like, oh yeah, absolutely. When we were doing these data science operations, we were doing blah, blah, blah. And I was using this platform. I'm Googling this platform as we speak. I've never heard of it. And I was like, this is incredible. So yeah. I imagine that we're gonna go into um, you know, each of these platforms and kind of evaluate how they work. We work really close with our legal team because the big concern about AI is privacy and just making sure that like while we're utilizing the platform, we, we don't want to release client information by putting their data into a platform. Some some of them have in their terms, like when you create an input, when you put anything into our data platform, it becomes open source data. So we're really cognizant of that. We're very careful about it. So I know that our legal team's just coming out uh, with our AI um, initiative, what we can and can't use, how we can and can't use it, and, and what we're gonna do. That will be the limitation, I think, for AI. In addition to what Carl's saying, privacy obviously being the biggest concern uh you know there's going to be legal precedent making sure what can and can't be used and how it can and can't be used and we'll be on top of that we have an amazing uh attorney that uh was a computer science engineer um and and went from making video games to being a lawyer so love his input looking forward to to seeing what we do with that but i'm hoping that ai is careful to protect users data so we can utilize it better on our end yeah Absolutely. What about you, Cahill? What do you see? How, how do you see AI helping us in the analysis? Are you using like ChatGPT's data analysis functionality much um, practically? So, great. You know, I actually see it as a sounding board and uh, I'll explain it like this. So did you ever have a problem you're trying to solve and you ask someone and you say it out loud and then you solve mm. your own problem? Through yeah. the kind of layered prompting of things like ChatGPT and other chat-based stuff, you can have those eureka moments. Like you are Archimedes yeah. jumping out of the bath and running down the street of Athens going, Eureka, I'm after coming up with this amazing, amazing solution here. 
So what AI allows you to do is use it as a sounding board. Now, this is not something a lot of people are kind of talking about. They're kind of, you, you know, they're going on journeys and they're, and they're kind of coming to the expected solution. But what about the unexpected solution? And this is what I'm most interested in when it comes to AI, because unlike your colleagues who want to finish work at four o'clock or five o'clock on a Friday, AI is always there. And it will always answer your mm-hmm. questions and continue to mm-hmm. answer your questions and your layered questions, giving you the ability to use it as a sounding board and again, have those eureka moments. So that's mm-hmm. what I've been using AI for a little bit. See, what I love, I love the fact that you can drop spreadsheets into uh, chat GPT. That's one. That's probably the file type I feed it most. I love the fact that if you export analytics from social media, uh, insight tools, social listening tools, keyword tools. That's when it does interesting stuff. I, th- I don't think you should be saying to ChatGPT, hey, ChatGPT, give me a keyword, you know, a list of keywords. It, that's not it. What you want to be doing is taking real data and big, heavy spreadsheets that would take a lot of wading through and say, here you go. Now tell me stuff about this. And I find it's actually, in general, very good at doing that. Um, I think that's one of its most interesting applications. Anything that can eat eat up spreadsheet data is like it's gold us for digital marketing. Have you ever tried um, Google Analytics? I have not tried that, but have you ever tried kind of Google Analytics or, or Google Ads reports feeding it that sort of stuff? I've done some Google Ads reports. Um, always a little bit of bias in that. So, you know, you, you take everything with a pinch of salt. But I haven't mm-hmm. done any Google Analytics stuff, but certainly Google Ads stuff just because I typically focus most of my attention in on Google Ads itself. You do. Yeah. What about you, Chris? You seen any interesting use use cases there? I, I love the idea of use cases. We're still limited at <clears throat> NP Digital because we haven't formalized the AI policy. Oh, yeah. So we can't use any client data or do anything at the moment. So everything we've talked about for 2024 strategy will be in San Diego in a week and a half. Um, and we are going to sit down and talk about finalize that policy, what we can and can't do, how we can and can't do it. And then I think it's, you know, hit the ground running from that point. So there will, it will happen before the end of this year. It will be up and running. I think I'll have a lot more to say in six months. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? Um, as an agency, you have this tension between you want to run fast and you want to adopt new technologies and pass those efficiencies on to your clients. Yeah. as well as be able to obviously do more work and be more be more profitable. Um, but at the same time, you are held back, aren't you, by this duty of care it's to your great. clients as well, right? And I suppose I can imagine that's, to some extent, frustrating, is it? They, we have clients that don't care and want us to hit the ground running, and we have clients that are very right. careful about their, their data privacy. <clears throat> we treat every client the same way, so... We deal with the frustration as it comes down the pipeline. Some people will be really upset with us, but we're like, hey, in five years, you'll appreciate that this data didn't get out and that you're not being sued. You know, like right. if you're a company in yourself, you get to do your own thing. You get to evaluate it. Well, like, like Cahill, because yeah. he can go in and take his own thing. You can take your own data. <clears throat> we just simply, we could do that with MP digital data, like GA4 data on our side. But with our clients, we're just so cautious. Like, we want to make sure that we're doing it the right way, but we're also doing it in a secure way. And so it is constantly touting a line uh, between being this, uh, I heard, uh, I used to work at a company called 22 Squared, <clears throat> and they used to say this thing, uh, a welcomed intruder, right? Advertising is nothing more than a welcomed intruder. That's your Amazon Alexas, your Googles, your phones. Yeah. And so it's touting that balance between being a welcomed intruder and staying far enough away to where people are not feeling like you're you're stepping on their toes, being invasive or just overly, you know, just being too much. So interesting, that isn't it? Do you think does 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 an agency like yours need to have like an AI policy that they, you know, publish and 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 sort of communicate yeah. and broadcast to their clients? So we will have an AI policy before the end of this quarter through our mm. legal team, and every single one of our uh, globally, I think we're at seven or 800 clients, but globally, all 800 clients will have to go in and sign that policy individually and they can opt out. And if they choose to opt out, we won't use AI for those clients and those that will, we we will use it, but we absolutely will have a policy. And that's why we've been so reluctant 
like when we talk about, you know, what are we going to use? We don't know, you know, we're, we're going to use whatever platform we best can that's going to yeah. protect uh, our clients investments, but it, it will be something that the client will be able to opt into or opt out of, and then we'll be able to hit the ground running. And, and then I think we can use case studies. If we're seeing positive impact, we can use case studies to convince clients that are a little more reluctant to be like, Hey, look at what we've been able to do with this client, this client, we can do the same for you if you allow it. So I think that's what's going to be happening. Like um, anything, it's about communicating benefits and risks, right? Yeah. I mean, what's and the worst that could happen? Here's, here's a little, you know, a bit on that, but also here's the opportunity and here's how likely that worst case scenario is. And Correct. Um, I think that's for them to weigh up, isn't it? And, and yes, you're right, probably from your side, a little bit of... Um, making the case for those efficiencies if you do believe that it's safe. And I think for most clients it probably is, to be honest. Yeah. Um, right. Well, look, um, I know time, uh, we're, we're running short on time. Um, well, we, we did some polls uh, recently on uh, LinkedIn and we, we did ask people what was frustrating them about GA4 specifically. Uh, when asked, what do you dislike about GA4? The most common question was complexity of setup, closely followed by user experience and design, uh, with actually the data thresholds and poor data insights being more minor concerns. And then when people were asked, what do you love about GA4? Uh, people mostly said, I don't like GA4, 54%. But uh, event tracking came in at 21% with data visualizations and lots of configuration options, kind of minor responses there. Um, so I look forward to the webinar because you're going to be talking about how we can hopefully overcome those frustrations. And I know you're not, you know, your job, you're not Google reps. <laughs> your job is not to... Um, convert people but it is ultimately look that's the analytics tool that the world has for free it's the most common and universal one so we might as well get over these points of friction right mm -hmm. or would you agree with that chris oh, yeah. yeah i mean it's it's what we have available right it will, yeah. will use it for the and and just know like there is frustration, but like there are people like myself and other analysts and executives that are going around like we are talking to Google. I, I'm in contact with Google quite frequently um, and we have a lot of weight from our enterprise clients to be able to like get a lot of face time with them. So we are working. We're talking about the challenges. We are talking about fixing them. Um, we just need them to acknowledge that they exist as it stands right now. There's, you know, a lot of solutions that aren't real solutions, but I think they know. I think there will be change. And I think until that change happens, let's do what we can. Absolutely. Well, look, um, we always do like to wrap up here with some uh, practical tips. Put you on the spot. Um, don't worry. It's not, you're not under any pressure to solve everyone's problems. Um, but Carl, just off the top of your head first, what tips do you have that someone can immediately uh, carry out right now before, of course, tuning into the webinar um, to really get them get more out of GA4. So one of the things I like to use in GA4 recently is the path exploration. So there's um, so within the explore area, which is your customization, you can create a path exploration, which will show you how people move through your website from starting point to an end point. Now, that's actually really counterintuitive because you want to start at your endpoint to work backwards. So in order to do that, there's a button in the top right corner that says start over. And when you press that start over button, it says, do you want to start at a starting point or an end point to work backwards? And when you choose the end point, you can just work your way backwards to what, where do the majority of the people who convert or buy on your site start out? And what do those typical journeys look like? So once you have once you have your goal set up, whether it's a purchase or whether it is a other type of conversion, you can go to those path explorations, go to the start over button, choose your endpoint and work backwards. And it's actually a fairly good report, you know. So that's something anyone can do now. Cool. And we'll probably highlight interesting journeys that people are taking. Cool. That's very cool. Um, that's a very good tip. 
Chris, any um, little tips for anyone just to start getting a bit more out of it ahead, of course, of the webinar? Yeah, of course. Connect your data sources. You constantly, I constantly go in and see huge enterprise clients and they don't have their search console and they don't have their search ads. And mm. if you go back into the admin portion and you just scroll down on connections, you see there are a host of things. All you need is a username and password. Link that data, even if you don't think you're going to use it. Um, they talk to each other, they make each other smarter. Just connect all those things in. You'd be surprised what you're going to start getting out of it. But I'm, I'm baffled by the number of people that they know it's there and they're just like, oh, I'm not going to go that deep, so I don't need to worry about it. And it's mm. it's not really about that. It's a, it's a There's a whole host of other things happening on the back end that are beneficial. Yes, why not have that fuller picture? Why not be able to query the, you know, your, your GA4 um with in any imaginable way and and have potentially those things feed in in ways yeah. you might not be able to predict or expect Agreed. um great look that's a great um some great tips there uh, thanks very much guys really appreciate it can't wait for the webinar it's going to be very uh, interesting i think and a, a must watch for people and i will look forward to seeing you then thanks very much Hey, thank you guys. Thanks.